But if you look at the Cohens or, or Aronofsky, there's a model there for, for making certain choices and making, yeah. uh, you know, making them happen. Um, I, I, feel like I'm in, I feel like I'm in a place where now it's really the ball's in my court. It's the challenge is on me to come up with that project that is, um, you know, I can talk about wanting to make adult films. Now I have to do it. I mean, one thing I took on as a job while I was doing Paul, because I wanted to have something on the side that was um, very different. Um, not that there's anything wrong with mainstream entertainment, and I will always want to come back to comedy, but I wanted to have something else, just to use another part of my brain, maybe. Uh, so I'm adapting this novel for Natalie Portman right now um, for Brad Pitt's production company, Plan B. And it's not really a novel. It's kind of a conceptual art piece, this book by this, uh, a woman named Leanne Shapton, who worked for the New York Times. She was the editor of the op-ed. She was like the visual, I don't know what the position is called, but she edited all the images and cartoons and things that appeared on the op-ed page. Um, she's no longer in that position. She's, does, she's an artist and a writer and she's doing other stuff and has a little publishing company. She's a really interesting person. And she'd gone to Truman Capote's auction, the auction of Truman Capote's stuff after he died, his memorabilia. I think she might have gone to the Marilyn Monroe one also. And she thought, just the auction book itself was a fascinating archaeological dig through a man's life. And she took that concept and made a, a book that is literally just photographs and captions that tells the story of a relationship between two people. They're not famous. It's, it's a fanciful idea. Um, it's a conceptual idea. But the book is really quite... Um, it really works. I mean, you're looking at all the gifts they gave each other, the love letters, emails, little just snippets of things that are in the captions. It's Joseph Cornell who does some of that too, right? Yeah, it has a Joseph Cornell um, uh, quality. And the filmmakers, like when I'm, so I'm trying to turn that into a movie, which is quite challenging. And it's for Paramount Pictures. I mean, it's not, we're not talking about something that's going to be made uh, on a mumblecore level. So, you know, it can't be entirely weird or else they're not going to want to make it. But I'm trying to, I've come up with a sort of Charlie Kaufman-esque framework to use the auction. Um, but, you know, there's a little bit of a, you know, Woody Allen a does it a lot. Is there a screenwriter, or are you doing... I've, I've, like, there's a character I've invented who's an auction specialist who, who sort of brings you through the movie. And, uh, you know, Annie Hall is actually brought up in the book. It's, a, it's, it's mentioned in things they give each other. They dress up like Annie Hall. Like Diane like Keaton and Woody Allen at a, for a Halloween party. And, and that's sort of breaking the fourth wall thing, which isn't, you know, it's not exactly new. I mean, Garcia launched it. But um, is an element in it. And I'm trying to, you know, slice and dice a, a relationship story. And, you know, even though the studio wants a comedy and I want it to be funny, I just keep saying, I'm sure I'm really annoying, but I keep saying it's not a romantic comedy. Well, Annie Hall isn't a bad model. If you think about it, it was. If you look at it, it looks like a very um, dramatic indie movie now. Even though there's laughs in it, yeah, it goes no, pretty to, far. In this, in this day and age, if someone's submitting that script, I don't think people would call that a comedy. No. Um, although it's hilarious and um, obviously, but I, you know, I mean, I've seen that film a million times. But what I've sort of taken away from it also, you know, is is trying to. Re that film does a great job of capturing the rhythms of a relationship without resorting to someone's having an affair. It's not melodramatic. I mean... That's true. There's not... The drama in it is really the drama the, between two people. Of how well, hard it is to love somebody. Up. Yeah. yeah. How hard it is to leave and how hard it is to stay. And, and that's the... Kind of at the center of this book. So, so it's been really interesting. It's been... Well, Natalie nice could help get it made if that's what she wants to do. She's, I, she's I know got she's too many a things. Rough, she's got a rough, it's a rough period for her in her career. Obviously, nothing's going right. She's not getting any attention from her work. And, yeah, no. Uh, it's a good, it's a very fortuitous time to be working with this board. And it's also, she's the right age for it. Um, I, I, it's it, just having had a meeting with her in person a few months ago, uh, she feels like she's, um, she's changed a bit. And, um, and she's, you know, she's a very, very smart young woman. So I'm trying to write a smart character. I think it would be quite exciting if this film ends up happening. Now, your friend Steven Soderbergh has been saying some things about giving up on on, uh, on movie directing. Um, I, I, what do you think is going on there? You know him pretty well. I had drinks with Steven a few months ago, and he had said the same thing to me. And I 
looked at him skeptically because he's prone to to big announcements like that, making bold bold pronouncements. And what? He's withdrawn be to, before. He has. He. I mean, he, I remember he did Schizopolis came out. Of, he was very, he had a very bad depressed phase. Yeah, he almost quit. He wasn't. I mean, there were a few times in the early years. Uh, I think after each movie, after Kafka, after um, the underneath, he wanted to he wanted to quit after those movies. And then and then obviously you know things changed a lot for him without a sight. Um, and he discovered that he's this guy who is actually really good at different kinds of movies. He's the Howard Hawks of our time. He is. He but is. he's also a workaholic who is probably exhausted. It's my it might, armchair theory. I think there may be some truth to that because Stephen is, I don't know how he's done. I mean, just the run he's had in the last few years, I don't know. And he's always working on the next thing before he finishes the one he's yeah. doing, you know? No, I mean, he's so insanely prolific and I... I Maybe there is a certain burnout. Maybe he just needs a few years off. And he'll but it's come also right back. a bad time in the business, you know. I, I'm not. That's I mean, as good he, as good as the whole uh, as the. I'm just gonna show that he's over there. All right. <laughs> see, <laughs> see, I'm a, I work with very serious people. I think there's a thing going on here. Oh yeah, look. Um, uh, yeah. Um, we gotta back up again. Um, all right. It is, I, I would agree, that it's not the greatest time. And it's probably, yeah. Um, because the, the people who do get, you know, someone like Aronofsky who does get to make some of these movies, he, he's, he's like, he's going to do X-Men now because, you know, you don't make money. You kill yourself. You, you raise funds overseas or whatever. You, ha you know, filmmakers don't want to have to do that. No, I mean, Darren said in an interview, and I, I totally know where he's coming from, that He's made several movies in a row now where he really feels like he's the only person who wants to see that film get made. And after a while, you just feel like, oh, it's just too hard. I mean, I'm working with all these other people who are putting up the money, and they're so begrudging you doing it. It's like no one feels good about it. No one has any confidence. And, and even though, you know, Black Swan is the surprising moneymaker... Um, no one treated it that that it had that potential whatsoever. So. We talked at the beginning. It, it, was, it was insanely difficult to do. Um, but do, do you find that the specialty divisions are chasing after you in a, in a reasonably attentive way? Um, I mean, I get submitted scripts, but my problem is that when I do a film like that, I really want it to be mine, and I've had I haven't stopped to really write my own thing. So that's that's. That's the problem with going off to do the studio film, is Paul was, you know, like a $42 million film, and to do a film with that many special effects, $42 million meant I was working, even in post I was working 12 hour days. I mean, it just took all of my energy. It was just so much work to get it right, because we didn't have any net. I couldn't, we, you know, many passes on the animation, uh, or I was told I could not have many passes on the animation, so many times I was just really, I had to give them very specific direction to the animating team because I knew I'd have to live with what they came up with. It Yikes. wasn't it wasn't like I imagine what Pixar does. Pixar is, does what you would want. They do it over and over and over yeah, again. And, they really, and if you go to an animation house as if it's a visual effect, that's a whole other process. Right. Right. And this and D neg as good as they are, double negative, they are an effects house and, and they were teaching themselves to be that to be like Pixar on this movie and that's a I have some work from them. They were great. I love them, and, and they're quite brilliant. But I can see, like I talked to, um, well, Simon's doing the movie with Brad Bird, and I and I've heard a little bit of what their processes and picks are, and they they rewrite the movie as they go along, and that must mean they throw away some very expensive animation. Well, they do rough animation, and and each scene that they they sort of sign off, and then they'll do they'll do that scene, and then there will be parts of the movie that aren't done. Yeah and they wait until they're ready. And they play off the animatic until it's ready. Until they're really satisfied, yeah. Which is an interesting, I mean, it's working. You're doing a good job. But you know, it's interesting when I talked to Barbara Binsky about Rango, it was, it was fascinating that I feel like there's a resistance to, to the formula now, even to Pixar. That people really? want to try to do it differently and, and mix it up. So it's good that you're, that you're what, you, what you were doing is, is innovative and it's good that you tried it. 
I think, I think, I, I mean, I was excited by the challenge of it. I mean, I've had a couple of, like, I don't understand why you're directing this movie conversations with people. But, uh, you know, I felt, well, maybe I can have uh, an approach to directing the animators that might be slightly different. Um, that I would think about it, try and take what I would say to an actor and turn it into a language that an animator would Understand. Would you want to, to do though? I mean, honestly, would you want to, to be direct an animated film? Because in a funny way, there's more freedom there than there is in any other kind of movie making. I actually think I would. I think that's much more interesting to me than doing a big budget, you know, comic book spectacle. movie. Yeah, yeah a spectacle like or a comic book movie. Because as much fun as they are, that's I, that's they're not. That's not my favorite kind of movie necessarily. I can enjoy that movie, but it's not the kind of movie that made me get into movies. Whereas the anime movies, a lot of the really good ones are doing stuff that strikes me as being very close to what I love, the you know, character, the story. Tell them. Tell them, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.